guide to that. Thank you. Thank you very much, President Dallel. And good evening and a warm welcome to our graduates, family, and friends. I'd like to start by congratulating our new graduates and wishing them success in the future. When I was invited to give this commencement speech, I was deeply honored, but I was also deeply nervous. I tend not to like giving unsolicited advice, especially to people I don't know yet. And I do not particularly like talking about myself. So it was not easy preparing for the speech. I would ask myself, what would an 81-year-old academic, a lifelong learner, and an AUC and through and through have to say to or advise a group of highly accomplished young people? So I thought that maybe the best thing was to share with you a few insights that I have had from my experiences, and I hope they will resonate with some of you. So I thought that maybe, so I tried to think back on what was going through my mind when I was at the same stage of your career. For starters, my generation had far fewer choices than yours has today, and the choices were easier to define. For me, the road was as clear as could be. I had a bachelor's degree in chemistry. I loved science, and chemistry was the only uh, science major at AUC, so it was an easy choice. I had a master's degree in solid state science. That, too, was the only master's degree offered at AUC. And I had been appointed as an instructor of chemistry at AUC. I was awaiting the offer of an assistantship to pursue a PhD in materials engineering in the United States. So again, you would ask why materials engineering? The answer is that AUC was getting ready to establish a department of materials engineering, and therefore, once I got my PhD, the plan was to return to AUC and embark on an academic career in this newly established department. In other words, I envisioned myself taking the typical steps that a university professor would take going up a vertical ladder, getting tenured, and hopefully reaching full professorship after a few years. Hence, I was thinking along what I would call a linear career path. For many of you, it's still possible to think of a linear career path the same way as I did. But I contend that for better or for worse, you have many more choices than we did then. And your career may take twists and turns that you did not expect. I will quote what Carl Fish, a well-known educator and teacher, said in 2006. We are preparing currently a workshop for a workforce for jobs that don't yet exist using technologies that haven't been invented in order to solve problems we don't even know are problems yet. He couldn't have been more correct. And I couldn't have been more wrong. My career path was anything but linear. When my husband and I obtained our PhDs and decided to remain in the United States, I resigned from AUC as was, and was faced with a totally different landscape. My husband was offered a job at the IBM Watson Research Center, and before I even knew, even started to think about what I would do, I was recruited and offered the possibility of a postdoctoral position at IBM. Now remember, this was a period of new affirmative action laws in the United States, and I am sure that my gender was the incentive for reaching out to me. They offered me a two-year position that fit the area of my research at their R&D facility in Fishkill, New York, a good 40 miles north of where we lived. So of course, there was no way I was going to reject IBM's offer. It appears that I was at the right place at the right time. Circumstantial luck, as they say. But although luck can make a difference, it is not enough. And here comes my first insight. An insight actually that came to me much later on. To make luck work in one's favor, it tends to be accompanied by humility. And by that I mean intellectual humility. The self-awareness that is much, there is much we simply do not know and that we need to have the self-confidence to admit it. This is what pushes one to learn more about just anything, to be intellectually curious and to become a lifelong learner. I accepted the job with a certain amount of trepidation. Was I up to it? I think the self-doubt helped. 
I had colleagues who were very willing to help, share and collaborate, and during those two years I learned a lot. I found the work exciting and the environment very stimulating. I worked hard and I adjusted to the corporate environment easily, and on the whole, I was very satisfied professionally. When I think back, I realized that I was on what I would call autopilot. I followed the expected path without too much thinking, worked hard, and was rewarded along the way. But at the end of the two years, I was faced with my first really difficult decision. I was being offered a permanent position at IBM, and I was feeling deeply conflicted and guilty about the offer. And this gets me to insight number two. Some of our best decisions occur when we are feeling deeply uncomfortable or conflicted. I knew I was feeling conflicted because I had this great job opportunity, an offer you can't refuse, as they say, but I realized that US corporate life was not for me. I was a young mother, and my husband and I were planning on having our second ch child with no family support. I felt I had to be home. I needed to be home for my children. But most importantly, and some of you might find this odd, I wanted to be able to spend one or two months every year in Egypt so that my children could spend time with family and friends and be no strangers to my beloved Egypt. Hence, a mere two-week holiday per year for the next five years was not going to work for me. I was lucky that I had a husband who supported me on whichever decision I made. So I abandoned the idea of a career with IBM and with it, the discipline I had chosen to specialize in. My professional life took a very different turn. For the next 13 years, I worked part-time as an adjunct faculty member, mostly at Fordham University uh, in New York City, teaching introductory chemistry and some great interdisciplinary science courses and although I knew that I may have burned my bridges for an academic career, I did not regret my decision. I, re I rediscovered my passion for teaching and gave it all I had. Now comes insight number three. Do not wait for your next job to do your best work. Luck came my way one more time at the end of the 13-year period. My reputation as a teacher apparently landed me a competitive tenure-track position at Fordham University, where I would be in charge of organic chemistry, a particularly challenging subject for our students, who were mostly pre-med students. So in spite of not having done any serious research during my long hiatus, and despite not having a PhD in the field, I was offered the job on the strength of my teaching with the understanding that research and publishing was still expected of me. I don't want to bore you with details, but I collaborated for many years with a scientist at Columbia University who was working on the photochemistry of the human lens, a fascinating field. I published several papers, presented at conferences, and got tenured a few years later. In the meantime, the wave of educational reform in the United States, particularly in the field in the STEM field, piqued my interest. For those of you that don't know what STEM stands for, it's science, technology, engineering, and math. Uh, I was captivated by the extensive research being done on how people learn and how some pedagogies are more effective than others. Then throw in the introduction of technology in the teaching and learning process, and you have a totally different ballgame. So this became my new passion. And for many of us, this is the reason why teaching is so exhilarating. You see, I think teaching, and I'm using it in the broader sense of the word, is actually the back door for lifelong learning, since you are constantly learning as you share knowledge with others, whether it be in a highly specialized field, an interdisciplinary one, or even the general field of knowledge. When my husband decided to take a retirement, we came back to Egypt, and at the age of 60, I embarked on my last and most exciting new career. As a good friend of mine says, the stars were aligned. I got hired at AUC to establish a center for learning and teaching, and here I had the opportunity to put into practice my new passion, and the rest is history. Today, the center is the largest of its kind, and it is thriving thanks to its leadership and the excellent team that it has. So you see, life is full of surprises. <laughs> and this gets me to my last insight. 
an insight that nobody on this stage can assert as strongly as I can. Old age can be great. <laughs> Thank you. I, I have enjoyed life these last 21 years at least as much as my younger years and sometimes more. I do not think of myself as old. Well, I, <laughs> I recently saw a Bugs Bunny cartoon where Bugs Bunny is telling Snoopy the dog, my mind still thinks I'm 25. My body thinks my mind is an idiot. <laughs> well, in my case, for some happy reason, my mind is vetoing my body. Henry Ford is reputed to have said, anyone who stops learning is old, whether at 20 or at 80. And anyone who keeps learning stays young. I think that may be the secret. Keep it in mind. Thank you for allowing me to share this moment with you. And thank you. Thank you very much.